So you want to... He's just still bound and determined to try out that ladder. And I told him, go ahead. I says, go ahead. It's the only way he's going to stop. So he's, he's not going to do it for a while. So it's, he'll change his mind. <laughs> but he'll, he'll be home hopefully tomorrow. So I told him we're going to come down and cut that bush down, though. You'll never have to play with that thing ever again. Okay, while, while they're coming up, I want to uh, welcome my oldest son, Peter, uh, from Pittsburgh, is here today, so I'm delighted to have him, and I've promised not to include him in any of my sermon illustrations today. Um, <laughs> instead, I'm going to tell a story on myself. Good morning. Today, we are honoring our graduates. Uh, they are both high school graduates. Unfortunately, neither of them could be here today. But we, are, we have Bibles that we will be dropping off for them. And our graduates this year are Xavier Baldwin and Dede, Dede Rodriguez. Now, both of them have kind of open plans. They don't have their futures fully planned yet. But I know that all of us, having watched them grow up, we know that these two young men, they're destined to do something great. They're both very, very kind young men both very good brothers, so we, we know that they're going to go out there and they're going to make the world a better place, and hopefully they can take the word of God with them, and that'll help them, you know, go out there and do the right thing. Thank you, Judy, for that excellent music. 
Uh, if you are able, please stand as we join responsively in the call to worship found in your bulletin and also on the screen. Uh, it's based on Psalm 19 and Psalm 36. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And now let us join together in the prayer of confession in unison. We blend our voices in common confession, O God. You are our hope and salvation. The apostle teaches that there are varieties of gifts, yet we judge others because they do not fit our mold. There is one Savior, yet we mistrust those who do not believe as we do and doubt that they are led by the same Spirit. Forgive us for the many ways that we sever the parts of Christ's body. Through him, reconcile us and pardon our estrangement through Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, remain standing as we sing joyfully unto the Lord. Number 465, what a friend we have in Jesus. The words are found on the screen. <laughs> Please be seated. Dave is our, our reader for the first reading taken from Philippians chapter 2, 
verses 12 through 18. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out on your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring or, and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. But even if I, but even if I am being poured out as a libation over the sacrifice in the offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, with all of you. And in the same way, you must be glad and rejoice with me. Word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Our second lesson comes from the Old Testament from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Hear once again God's holy word. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrong, wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. May God bless to our understanding this reading from his holy word. Would you bow your head with me in a moment of prayer? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. You know, my childhood was perhaps a bit different than um, most since I was with my parents in the Belgian Congo when that country received its independence back in 1960. And there was much turmoil that uh, resulted, and we were evacuated because of the communist troops that were coming in uh, with intent to kill. All the seats were taken out of the plane to get more people in. We only had the clothes on our back, and I had a little uh, Disney treasury storybook, and that was it. Our, our family spent six months in Salisbury, uh, Rhodesia, after we were evacuated. 
And then my dad returned with some of the other men to train the nationals, while my, my mom, my sister, and I all returned to the States. Well, my mom traveled all over the United States speaking about missions during the next year. And so my mom was kind of uh, in and out every couple of weeks and using uh, my grandma's house as her home base. And so that we might have uh, some stability as uh, young children, let's see, I was in um, second grade then, uh, we stayed with Grammy Hurd, as we affectionately called her. She was uh, over six feet tall. She was loving, but she also had kind of a stern quality uh, that surfaced sometimes whenever least expected. Now, I would always go along with Grammy to Kroger's uh, for grocery shopping. And she usually got my sister and me each a little box of those Barnum and Bailey animal cookies. Uh, that was always good comfort food. And I loved animals since my earliest uh, memories. My mom said it was because during her pregnancy, she sat behind a family in church who had a little boy who was always busy playing with his little plastic farm animals. But anyway, one day I decided I didn't want just the usual animal cookies. I wanted some licorice. I was too bashful to really ask Grammy, and so I sneaked two five-cent packages of licorice into my pocket. Then we walked home, and I helped Grammy unpack the groceries. Then I went to the other room, and I found my sister, and I whispered to her, here are your cookies, and here is some licorice too, but don't say anything about it. Now, what did my sister do? Boy, was I naive. She went immediately to Grammy and asked why I didn't want her to say anything about the licorice. Well, Grammy then marched me down to Kroger's, and I was unaware that she knew the manager quite well. She walked up directly to him and she said, this boy has something to tell you. And I was thinking, not me, you've got to be kidding. I was old enough to know that it was stealing and that it was wrong. Grammy said, are you going to put him in jail? Not this time but he had better never ever do it again. Well, you know what? That experience emblazoned in my heart the meaning of one of the Ten Commandments. In fact, every time I see licorice, it is a reminder of that day that I will never forget. And I tell you this story because it left a lasting impression on me. I appropriated this principle as my own. Every time I read from Exodus 20, I think of two five cent packages of red licorice. It's nice when other people have faith and believe in God and follow God's principles and guidelines for living, but it's kind of pointless until it becomes real to me. I also learned, be sure your sin will find you out. It didn't matter that I thought I was going to do something good by sharing my stolen licorice with my sister. 
a wrong did not make it right because I had a generous heart in wanting to share my stolen goods. That day impacted my life forever. Why would Grammy say, are you going to put him in jail? <laughs> right, that was only ten, it was only 10 cents worth of licorice. But you know, Grammy was a wise woman. She wanted me to know that big or small, follow what God says. She didn't rant or rave or lecture me. She knew that her question about jail to the manager would get my attention and would leave an impression on a seven-year-old. Somebody can share their faith with us. From my earliest childhood, my parents and Grammy did just that. So did my Sunday school teachers. They could explain principles from the Bible. They shared their faith. But then I got my own faith. I developed a set of beliefs. As a seven-year-old, my Sunday school teacher could teach me the Ten Commandments. I listened, and I was generally a compliant child. But you see, I was not always obedient. I did not always listen to what I heard. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew as a seven-year-old that it was wrong to take that licorice, but I wanted it. The desire for self-gratification overruled what I had been taught. But then came a new, more impressive teaching. There might be some serious consequences. You could end up in jail if you follow this path. And so the Ten Commandments sunk into my brain indelibly. For many years, I have tried to share my faith in different ways uh, with others. And here's how I would sum it up. First, somebody shared their faith with me. Next. I got my own faith. Then I've shared my faith with others. Um, I was pondering, and I, I think it was probably about 20 years ago. Do you remember when that uh, slogan was real popular, got milk? Well, my question is, got Jesus? Got faith? That's what chapter 2 of Philippians is all about that Dave read a portion of that earlier. Paul is writing to his dear Philippian friends and he was really close to them. Paul loved them deeply and they loved him. I think it's interesting to note that uh, this is really the only church that Paul would accept gifts from. Paul could accept gifts from them because he had such a close and warm relationship with them. He knew he could trust them completely and they would never end up being suspicious of him. They were like his very own children and he was their father figure. Paul had taught them the faith. He had nourished them. He had advised them. He had encouraged them. And they were so dependent on him and his leadership with sound advice. And that is really where the problem was because Paul knew that his days on earth were numbered. He knew that soon he would be executed by the Romans and he would no longer be around to parent them in their faith. That very soon they would have to stand up for their faith to stand on their own two feet spiritually. And so in essence... Paul was really saying uh, to them, I'm not going to be around very much longer to spoon feed you. You're going to have to work out your own salvation. In other words, grow up. 
stand tall, be strong, be mature, take responsibility for your own spiritual life. Find your own faith, hope, and love. I won't be with you, but God will. In fact, God will be with you every single step of the way, and he will see you through. I've shared my faith with you, and now it's time for you to grow up and get your own faith so you can share your faith with others. Now let me ask you something. When it comes to faith, can you say, I've got my own? When it comes to hope, can you say, got my own? When it comes to love, can you say, got my own? I want us to take a look at these three uh, dramatic signs of spiritual maturity and see how we're doing in each one of these areas. First of all, we need our own faith. Remember with me the story about the little boy who was asked why he was a Christian? And he answered, I don't know for sure, but I think it runs in the family. Well, I suppose that's a cute story. But I believe we need to add another footnote. We can ride on the coattails of our own family only for so long. And then each of us must individually make our own personal decision for Jesus Christ. Of course, the family can help us occasionally, and it certainly is great whenever they do. But each of us at some point has to make our own personal decision for Jesus Christ. Here and there, the family can help out, and it's great when they do. But at some point, we make that decision to receive Christ. It's great when granddad is a devoted Christian. It's wonderful when mom is a committed disciple. It's fantastic if dad is an active churchman. But somewhere along the line, I have to make my own decision, my own commitment, my own acceptance of Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Have you made that decision yet? Have you invited Christ into your life? Have you turned your life over to him? Now the second sign of spiritual maturity is that we need our own hope. A woman was at work one day when she received a phone call telling her her daughter was very sick and had a high fever. So that woman left work immediately. She stopped by the pharmacy to get some medicine for her daughter. But when she came out of the drugstore, she discovered that in her haste, she had locked her keys in the car. And she was now feeling in a panic. She really needed to get in the car and get home with that medicine fast. But now she was locked out of her car. What on earth was she going to do? And this was before our uh, automatic uh, power windows. And this woman remembered hearing about people using a wire coat hanger to open the door. And she actually found one on the ground not far away and tried to use it to get into her car, but no luck. She didn't know how to do that. So in desperation, she prayed, oh, God. Please send someone to help me. A few minutes later, an old car pulled up and a rough-looking character got out, and the woman thought, Oh, Lord, is this who you sent to help me? The man walked over to her and said, Looks like you need a little assistance. Can I help you? Oh, yes, said the woman. My daughter is very sick. I stopped to get her some medicine and I locked my keys in the car. 
I must get home to her. Please, can you use this hanger to unlock my car? Sure, the man said. He took the hanger and in less than a minute the car was opened. The woman hugged the man and said, Thank you so much. You are a very nice man. The man replied, Some people don't think I'm so nice. I just got out of prison yesterday and I was in prison for car theft. <laughs> the woman hugged the man again with sobbing tears and cried out loud, Oh, thank you, God, you even sent a professional. <laughs> well, I think this humorous little story is a parable because it reminds us God doesn't always send what we expect, but he will always send what is needed. It's up to us to have the wisdom to recognize the difference and to be truly thankful. That's why we as Christians are people of hope. Because we know that even though when we have difficulties and setbacks in this life, that ultimately nothing can defeat us. God wins, and he wants to share his victory with us. That is God's promise to always be with us and to eventually see us through. This is our hope. And even if the victory does not come in this life, it will come in the life to come. But let me ask you this. When it comes to hope, can you say, got my own? The third sign of spiritual maturity is that we need our own love. Jesus taught us in both word and deed the miracle of love. But the question is, have we really learned the lesson of love yet? It was a beautiful spring day when a mother, father, and their little girl went out um, as a family uh, for a ride in the car. The weather was so gorgeous that the mother rolled down the windows to enjoy the breeze. But anyway, suddenly a large bee darted into the car and started buzzing around. And the little girl went into a panic because she was highly allergic to bee stings. If she were stung, she could die within the hour. Oh, Daddy, she squealed in horror. It's a bee. It's going to sting me. The father pulled the car to a stop, and he reached back to try and catch the bee. Buzzing around toward him, the bee bumped against the front windshield. There the father trapped the bee in his fist, and hiding it in his closed hand, the father waited for that inevitable sting. The bee stung the father's hand, and in pain, the father let the bee go, and the bee was loose again in the car, and the little girl panicked again. Daddy, it's going to sting me. The father said to his daughter gently, No, honey, the bee is not going to sting you now. Look at my hand. The bee's stinger is in my hand, and he can't hurt you now. The father let the bee sting him to save his daughter's life. Jesus took the sting of the cross, and through his sacrificial love, he saved us. And in that incredible act of self-giving, he taught us not only how very much he loves us, but also how he wants us to love one another. Jesus loves us sacrificially, generously, graciously, unconditionally. 
And that's just how he wants us to love. Can you love like that? Do you love like that? Will you love like that? Let me ask you something. When it comes to faith, hope, and love, can you say, got my own? God, I ask that you would continue in our hearts that work begun, that we would be transformed so that we can go out to change the world by the power of your spirit. Impress on each of us how crucial it is to have our own faith and not somebody else's. Do your work in our lives to make us stop and think through and to be willing to change, to develop a deep and abiding personal relationship with you that will grow and thrive so that we can serve effectively in your name. Amen. you at this time to share any prayer requests that you might have today, any joys or concerns. Kind of quiet out there. Are you still with me? Okay, Sally. Uh, I want to thank everyone who was, um, came to our memorial service and everyone who was here for the Thank you. Other others? All right, some days are quieter than others. <laughs> we still have a lot of folks on our uh, prayer list, and we want to continue to pray for Art as he's very anxious to get back home tomorrow. <laughs> Should we look to God in prayer? Lord, there's always so much for us to do. Time flies past and we rush around. We never find the time we really need to relax, to let go, to rest in you. We are so busy, we feel indispensable and life tends to overwhelm us. Sometimes it dulls our joy. We become tired, irritable, and tense. We lash out at others and make mistakes. Politicians, businessmen, workers, housewives, parents, teachers, rich and poor, young and old, we look for rest, for a time of healing, for the Sabbath time made for us. Lord, there's always so much for us to do. Our minds are a whirlwind as we rush around. We never have the time we really need to stop and think about what we do, to ask ourselves about our own lives. We forget the needs of others in your world. Our conscience is blunted by endless action. We blunder and bluster through life. Voluntary workers, farmers, shopkeepers, sports enthusiasts, avid readers, upper, middle, and working class. We look for opportunities to sit and think, for time to reassess our lives, 
for the Sabbath time made for us. Lord, there is always so much for us to do. The world is full of bustle and noise. We never have the time we really need to stop and listen to others and to you. We do not always hear the cries of need made by our own children in our own homes, the cries of those suffering elsewhere in the world sometimes die on the wind. We cannot share our burdens with others because we are unwilling to shoulder theirs. Academics and manual laborers, assembly line workers, skilled craftsmen, confident, nervous, mature, or adolescent, we all need to be listened to. We need time to listen, the Sabbath time made for us. Lord, there is always so much for us to do and running our own lives to our own satisfaction. We do not have the time we really need to put you at the center of our lives. We push our faith into the background where it is safer, unobtrusive, reassuring. We are too busy to change our routines, to find room for you and your demands. It's hard to find the time even to pray. And so powerful and oppressed, sick and well, minister and banker and cleaner, men and women, black and white, you long for us. You are there for us whenever we call, when we find that Sabbath time for you. We pause to pray for those mentioned today. For those, O oh God, who have entered into your eternal kingdom as they rest from their labors, give comfort to the family members and those, O oh God, who need your healing touch in their lives and who look forward to the future you have for them. We ask particularly that you would meet their needs this day. Hear our prayers as we offer them in the name of our Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. Help us to give generously as a response to God's many blessings for us.
joined as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have received God's gifts beyond measure. Joined as builders, as those who shape the faith community, we offer our gifts and ask for God's blessing. Joined in the discipleship of Jesus, we offer our gifts for the distressed, the suffering, those who lack opportunity, those who lack confidence, and ask for God's blessing. Joined as those who have been richly blessed, we are confident that we also can be a blessing. Amen. Remain standing as we sing together, Open my eyes that I may see. Mind you, you're welcome to go to the Fellowship Hall and enjoy uh, donuts in celebration of all the June birthdays. You have signed us with the cross, O God. May we be signs of Jesus Christ, a sign of community to the lonely, a sign of hope for the discouraged, a sign of compassion to the downhearted, a sign of challenge to the apathetic, a sign of love to the rejected. In the spirit of Christ, we have everything to gain. And now may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I think it's worked out. 